Welcome, everybody. Great to see you all. And uh, we have a guest speaker tonight, Fred Willis. Uh, he's from the, uh, is it the North? No, it's New Jersey Division New for the Jersey NMRA. Division. Yep. And uh, I've known Fred for a number of years that we, we've met together at different meets um, in Jersey and Pennsylvania. Uh, he's a scratch builder by nature. Um, and he was one of the three judges that came to my house a couple of months ago that looked at some structures that just pulled the rug out from under me. Oh, no, I didn't mean, I mean, he really, they did a nice job evaluating my structures. Yes. <clears throat> um, and no, but it was great though, just to have a few guys here when you had nobody coming by to appreciate the work you've done was a real uplift. So I, I wanted to thank you again, Fred, for coming out here and making that trip. Enjoyed it. Cool. Did so, you get your two merit award yet? Um, uh, you know what? I have to follow up on that. You're right. I haven't heard yet, uh, but I will follow up on that. Um, so Fred's got about a 20 minute presentation you'd like to share. And as always, you know, Fred's cool with this. Make it be interactive. You don't have to wait till he gets yeah. to the end of, of, of the presentation. So feel free to ask any questions on scratch building windows. So Fred, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. Okay, do I go through the green again? Share screen? Yep. And then blue. There you are. Here. Okay, here we go. Rock and roll. Right, first, it's a pleasure to be here, everybody. Um, I have to thank Tom for giving me the opportunity to speak. I am I'm a retired mechanical engineer and I build things. <laughs> and I got into structures. I'm one uh, one structure short of my um, merit award or achieve, achievement award with the NMRA with structures. But I always scratch build. Nothing wrong with kits. Never uh, see nothing wrong with them. I build them myself. But to me, if a model doesn't make me want to take up drinking at least once as a hobby in the process of building it, it's not a model I should be building. I should be finding something else. Uh, so, I built. Um, I modeled the North Model Maine in 1900, and so everything I'm looking at is old. Of course, it's not as old as what all of you are looking at, but it is old. And a lot of the structures I have built, you don't have windows available. Now we all know when we start building structures, particularly old structures. Windows really help create the atmosphere. We build them because we can't buy anything that looks right. And if you mess up the windows, no matter how well you do the building, it just doesn't look right. But we also know that uh, the windows help identify the time frame. They start, uh, you change the windows and the time frame of the building changes. And no, we also know that no matter what building we choose, the windows that are going to be available are not the ones we need. You know, it's one of those hidden laws of model railroading. But when you, I have, I have two techniques I use for building. And when you start to make windows, there's two questions you have to ask. It's like trying to maximize two variables. Do you want detail or do you want to do it fast? You can't have them both. So I've learned using two tips. I have two different processes I use. There's many other ways out there. If you go up and you look at YouTube, you can find different ways to do it. You can go to um, Model Railroad or Railroad Model Craftsman. They all have different ways of doing it. I'm a firm believer, once you find something that's doing what you want, use it and use it until you can't use it anymore, till it doesn't do what you want. So I have two procedures I use. One will give you extremely good detail, but it's going to take you a while. The other will turn out any type of window you want, but it's just not going to have quite the detail. You can do this much quicker. So I'll show you both of them. And if either one of them uh, you can use, great. This is the process of detail. You may have seen this building before. It was written up in scale rails in June of 2006. This is a building that exists. It's called Chief Warehouse. It exists in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The building was is known to have existed in, before 1705. It had many uses. It's been changed in form throughout its history. 
And this is close to the way it looks now with the exception of its base. But the important thing is there are six over six windows. I forget the exact dimensions. I think they're three by six. And there was nothing on the market that looked like this. This is the front end of it. Um, and once again, you have six over six and you also have a nine uh, pane window up there. And I could find nothing that came close to that. So I was kind of stuck. This is another building that I just partially used the uh, scratch built ones. This is a station, Boston and Maine, Kennebunkport Station. It's long gone, but what made this interesting is it had a tower in it. Tower didn't last real long, but it was uh, the unique feature of this building. And I believe the building still exists, but the tower is long gone. These building, these building, or excuse me, these windows are nine over six. These are made from styrene. The ones you saw in the sheep warehouse are made from wood. Now, um, there's also some bought windows on this one, but the primary windows down in here, these are scratch built windows. The process I used on this one came from an article in uh, Railroad Model Craftsman in November of 1999. I was trying to get a copy of it for you, but unfortunately there were some problems with that. But if anybody has an old magazine around, it's by a fellow named Richard Knapper. And what this is, and even if you never see the article, you could still make this jig. You are going to build the models in this jig. And what it is, is you have, in this case, it's a 32 thousandths inch piece of brass. These are all 65 thousandths. And what you're really building is a channel or a, essentially a shell that you're going to build the, uh, the window in. So really you can, whoops, we lost this here. I've, uh, the article gave three sizes. I work in HO, but it really depends whatever size you work in. Look at the size of the windows you need. Like if they're three by six, uh, four by eight, whatever. Uh, you can make these channels. And you can see the whole thing is, of course, to make sure that everything is absolutely straight. If you don't get it straight, you're wasting your time. So, but you can see essentially layout lines. And I think these are three inch, three feet wide in HO. And I think this is three feet six. It's been a long time since I've uh, I measured it, I don't really remember now. But you can see there's nothing unique about this and that make sure your lines are straight, you put down these side pieces. And what you want is, and I prefer, the article at that time talked about drilling and screwing them in place. You could probably use uh, some of the CA glues, but I would not trust it because if you ever broke it in the process of making one, you're gonna lose the window. And there's too much time involved with that. So I prefer the screwing it down. You, what you end up doing is you have a brace at the bottom, you slide it into place, clamp it in place. I have a little uh, stand I put it on. It's a piece of scrap wood approximately nine by nine inches square and it sits about, it's half an inch or it's quarter of an inch thick. I have it on a three on a, a legs an inch high and it allows me to clamp down, say up here, the whole piece and then I can clamp this in place. You set it for the length you have and now you have a bait or a frame to build this in. Now, for all of these models, oops, here we go. Uh, essentially parallel pieces of uh, brass. The big advantage of this is you can make double hung windows. They're not going to be flat and they can be, end if, you can use, uh, if this is too wide, you can use spacers in there to shorten it. It's not the best thing unless you machine the brass to be exact. I've done it with wood. I'll do it with wood again if I have to. It's, it gives you good results, not quite as good as, as the brass itself because you're gonna have to press against this along the way. And the wood might have a little bit of give. It. But allows you, if you're gonna make uh, let something three feet wide. You can make them anything you want. They can be two feet in length. They can be 16 feet in length because of this adjustable <laughs> stop you have here. Um, you, can, you, you can make them of both wood and styrene, which I have. 
the one thing you always want to do is when you start your work, put down uh, wax paper because all these glues that cannot glue glue together dissimilar materials manage to ma uh, glue together brass or I mean um, styrene or wood to brass. <laughs> Even if it says cannot do it, they're not telling you the truth when it comes to windows. <laughs> so therefore, always put down um, uh, yeah, wax paper. So because you you probably have to force a exacto knife blade underneath this to take it out, and you don't want to do it against the uh, the window itself. Do it against the uh, wax paper. Now, what I discovered is before you actually make the window, lay it out and determine all of your sizes because you have to account for the thickness. Whether you make them in 10,000 strips or 20,000 or whatever, you need to know what all these pieces are. Uh, I can work the model here. I could not cut wood down as, th as thin as 20,000, so I can now. I prefer working in wood as opposed to styrene, but it depends on how ambitious I am. And so I can work in either one. It's easier to work in styrene, of course, than it is in wood because you have to cut a lot more wood. But I can cut it down to 16, down to 10 thousandths. Not easily, but I can do it. But whether you're doing it with wood or whether you're doing it with the styrene, make a pattern of it. Lay out every piece because you're going to have to adjust your pieces due to the thickness of the other pieces. You just can't say, a, uh, when you've got, you've got a box you're filling up. So I make these windows like that, uh, lay it all out, put them in a pile and cut the wood. Now to run back to here, what you really want to do is you want to put down a horizontal piece, a horizontal piece, put in your two verticals, and then you proceed to make sure that they are dry and strong. And if you have to wait a couple hours or a day, so what? Now. While it's a little difficult to see, this was made years ago. These windows are about 20 years old. What you really want to do is by using spacers in here, I'm just going to say, suppose this is six feet long. So your middle piece is three feet, which makes each one of these little things approximately one foot, but you'll have to adjust for your uh, the thickness of this. You put in a start at the bottom, put in a spacer, put in your side, your uh, mullion in this one, and just work your way up to build your lower frame, your lower window. You can then make a using, since this is styrene, use wood, never use the same material uh, for obvious reasons, but we all make mistakes. Ask me about it. Uh, you then can make a spacer in here of, if this is uh, 30,000 or 60,000 high, you wanna make the upper one 30,000, 30 thousands, put a spacer in there and then build a window on top of it the same way as you built the bottom. Once you get that, you can just remove it, pull your pieces out. This will come out or stick a knife under there with the, um, with the wax paper. The whole thing will pop out uh, and they are rigid, they are strong. They're like what you buy in a store or commercially, but you can make this to any way you want. You want four over four, five over 17, whatever. This is the big event. <clears throat> now, when I was doing this 20 years ago, these were taking about two hours per window. So it's not something that goes fast. I can do them faster now. I haven't done any recently, but you're still talking, I would say for a window of this magnitude, you are probably talking about an hour's worth of work at least. So. There is a price to this. I mean, they're not fast to do, but then you just would mount them at the same you, as you would mount any other commercial window. If your window holds properly, this will fill right in. Now, if you know, uh, Tom had mentioned that one of you may be working on a model that requires multiple windows of the same type. There were 12 <coughs> of this type. These are all three by sixes, I remember. And it was just an assembly line process. Uh, I added uh, I added styrene at the back at, at the tail end of this, put it on the inside, so I had uh, windows panes in there. I did the same thing with this. 
And uh, I could find nothing commercially that I thought was worth buying. And from my standpoint, it was well worth the time I spent on it. Uh, now, a second method, if you don't want to spend that much time or you don't need double hung windows. Oops, this is saying. There is a second method I discovered. And this, it's a little difficult to see it here, but these were the drawings for it. This is, these are all windows which are not double hung. They are all flat windows. They are made on styrene, on clear styrene. Once again, you can make them any size you want, any number of frames. Uh, it's just a matter of knowing you have proper dimensions. In this one, this method, neither of these are my original, are original, original of by me. There's a fellow in Sweden, he, he works under the name of Markland of Sweden. I, I assume Markland is his first name. He has a YouTube channel and he does very good work using everyday pr uh, products. He doesn't go out uh, and buy anything real fancy. It's all stuff you can find at home. And he laid out this next procedure I'm going to show you. And um, I used his procedure. I modified. I've learned that every procedure you use, you change. So I could tell you exactly how to make it. And if each one of you did it, you do it a little differently, just like I do. But the procedure, the basic essence of the procedure is what you're looking for and you just make changes depending upon how you work. Now, in this case, Marklin uses clear styrene of 10 or 10 or 15 thousandths. I'll, I'll jump back, but as it, he covers it, let me just say here, you cover this styrene with masking tape. Put the masking, this is uh, not one that I made, but this is just showing you. Make sure the masking tape is down properly. No gaps, no bubbles, no folding over. But you, if you put it down and make sure it's in full contact, you are starting off correctly. Once you get your masking tape down, you want to draw out your windows. Now this strip happens to be with scrap and it's about an inch wide. Normal, I think for a styrene a sheet is about three inches wide. So you could take this window, which is a three by six window in HO, and you could put two or three next to it. I would leave at least a half an inch of space between them for reasons I'll go to, into, and another half an inch or so if you wanted to draw this going up and line. The one thing about these windows are make extras. You damage this, you don't do it quite right, there is no way to repair it. The, the um, method I showed previously, you can repair those. This method, you cannot. All you can do is throw it out. So if you need 10 windows, make sure you make 12 or 14 windows. You know if you make 14 windows, you'll do everything correctly. If you make 10, you know you'll screw up something along the way. So now, what you end up doing, this is, these are completed windows, but what you end up doing is you've laid out all your windows here. Now using a straight edge, and I prefer clamping the uh, styrene down and using a straight edge and clamping that down, but it depends on how you work. You want to cut, here is the outer edge, whoops. Here is the outer edge of the window. This is three by six. You wanna cut from on this line, you want to cut on each of these lines. You want to cut a strip away, meaning now Marklin says make two cuts a millimeter apart. I'm not that good at measuring, so I sit there and I just wing it. But basically, you would cut this line and then uh, a millimeter to the inside, you would cut another line. And you remove the tape. You do that for each line. So you have to lay this out and make sure that you're cutting your lines so everything looks equal. But really what you end up doing is you cut away all the lines you see drawn here and you are left with 
plastic underneath it. Don't cut into the plastic. Make nice, clean cuts or whatever you think is good. And um, you have lines there with tape in between. The tape is now your uh, window frames. Now, this is these are some that have been made and I'll use this as a moment. This, this one had multiple windows laid on it. You want to come in and take whatever color you're going to paint your windows and you paint it. If you want the, uh, sh a shocking pink, make your windows shocking pink, whatever you want. I prefer uh, uh, antique white, but you come along and you want to paint the all of, you want to paint everything. The uh, tape, you definitely want to make sure that it's down in the grooves. Don't go overboard, but this is why the tape must be flat because anything that's not flat is going to get underneath and you're going to throw the window away. So now you paint all your windows, let it dry. I know that I use the craft paints. I forget uh, just the craft paint you get at Michael's or another store like that. And, uh, but make sure it's dry. I think they say it dries in half an hour, an hour, whatever time they say, double or triple it. I generally would leave it sit overnight because if you find out anything is not dry in there, it's going to ruin your window. Now you come along and it's all dry. Remove each pane, each of the, uh, uh, the tape over each pane. You start to see the outline of the window. You can, at that point, uh, you actually don't have to do these outer lines and this one I did. Take your wood, whatever you're saying, six inch wide, whatever it is, cut your fr outer frame, glue that in place. I always overcut them and then I tape, then I uh, file it down, my own way of working. But then make sure everything is dry again. You can come in, you can cut it. Just use a X-Acto knife or whatever you use for cutting styrene, you cut it. You end up, these are not the best of the windows, but they work. These are ones that I actually did not use. I used better ones on the model. These, but they show you what if you do all your painting correctly, you get very good. If you don't do it as great, you get not as good window. That's again, make sure your painting's good. But, and this was the first time I did this. So these are probably uh, tryouts on this, but you sand it down. You now have a very nice window. Just don't touch the paint. Now, when you, there's one trick that uh, I do not remember Marklin discussing in here, but use this model. These windows now are 15 thousands plus maybe 10 thousands of wood. At most are maybe 30 thousand. Lining them up against the wall is not easy. And you can wreck your entire appearance by having the window angle. What I learned to do at that point, lay the window down, lay the, the surface of the wall down flat, Take the cut your window to the your window opening to the proper dimension. Take your window, put it into the opening, and slide it to the till it's a, touching the outer wall, till it's really flat against the outer wall. So it's you know you've got it sitting on a piece of white paper or something, so that it's set up flat all the way along here. And these one and then takes a little bit of styrene or clear plastic, whichever you prefer. You want something which you want to make sure that you've got wood frames along here because what you want to do is behind the wood frame, put in a piece of styrene. You know, this is three feet, this is two feet wide. You put in two feet or a foot, whatever you think is appropriate. On the inside, you can make it smooth against the wall on the inside, and you put strips along in there. The window is now glued to the strips and is glued to the wall and it is flat. And you have windows which are certainly passable. These can be turned out faster. And so I have, I use these two methods. There, there's maybe a better methods out there, but these work. I'm a firm believer in once you find something that works, use it until you can't use it anymore. So right now I have found that these windows, these two methods work well. 
Uh, just as a little pat myself on the back, this model that you're looking at here did win first place in the NMRA's Mideast region two years ago at uh, our convention. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them, but those are the two methods that I use for making windows. Um, I could piggyback on something if- uh, Go ahead. By way of a tip. Sure. Uh, I don't know whether you can, can see, uh, can see the screen, but uh, on your on your quick um, solution, yes. Uh, what I have done is gone to an art supply store and bought uh, an acrylic pen, and okay. I don't know whether you guys can see, uh, but I'm I'm holding one up, um, and that um, I I just take a straight edge with the acrylic pen. They come in different colors, white, black, yeah. whatever you buy the thickness you like yeah. and they apply uh, a nice clean line with a straight edge to your glazing material uh, and that would shortcut you from having to cut all your um, masking tape. I've, I've had good luck with them. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So this was, <laughs> excuse me, this was the method I came across. When I was building this model, I said, I am not spending hours. I've spent hours putting your putting down all of these things. I said, I'm not doing it, making windows also. So I stumbled on that one, but yes, you're right. Uh, that's a shortcut method of this and nothing at all wrong with it. It's a good method. It's a good variation of it. Another possibility if you have a uh, pre-cut machine or something similar is to uh, have it cut out the mask for you and then uh, like they, they have vinyl with uh, adhesive on one side. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, what type of machine? Uh, a Cricut or a Cricut. I don't know exactly what the, how it's pronounced, but. Uh, Crick, Cricut, my wife's got one and she uses it all the time, make t-shirts and stuff. It's spelled C-R-I-C-U-T, sorry. I don't know if it would be capable to make stuff that small, but maybe if you're uh -huh. scale or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's actually pretty versatile. Uh, I don't see any reason why I couldn't make a mask like that. Wondered about those things. Um, I've got another shortcut that I can add to uh, Markland's method. Okay. Um, if you want to get your straight lines and everything, uh, first print them out on your transparent window material. Oh. Uh, I put this through my laser printer and with all my windows on it and everything's straight. And uh, if you're having trouble with color, which I often do, um, I don't necessarily put down the whole masking tape and cut everything out, but mm -hmm. I cut my own millions, about uh, maybe a half a millimeter thick out of artist tape. Yes. Um, Pre-paint it, uh, then cut them out then lay them on top of my printout. Um, I've got nice straight lines to guide me. And then when you're done, you, of course, you've got lots of room around it, but you've got your square window ready to be cut out and put behind your wall. Okay. The other thing I've used I'm was, something. yeah, the other thing I've used is that similar to what John's talking about, they have pinstripes. There's very, very different thicknesses of tape. Oh, and yeah. I actually made mullions and whatever they are uh, on, on some clear styrene. And that worked reasonably well, but you still got to get them straight. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't, don't get me started. Back before, back before computers, and they had actually graphic artist materials, they had something called chart tape. Chart. Uh, which was uh, little thin strips of tape used for map making. Right. And you could buy that in any color and any width you needed. And I, I, I had a whole town full of buildings with windows with all the mullions made out of chart tape. Oh, wow. Cool. Good. But now, now we're stuck with having to make our own. But, you know, if you got an exacto blade and artist tape, you can, you can do it. But, Yes. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny how there's there's so many different little approaches to uh, minimizing the pain and anguish of 
making your own windows to fit the prototype that you're trying to recreate. Any, any other questions or comments for Fred? Okie doke. Cool. Hadn't, hadn't seen that, that Markland method before. It's, it's kind of like the reverse, reverse yeah. way of doing things. Right. He has a lot of nice um, little videos up there. Because mm -hmm. uh, I've looked at one uh, where he makes a river out of, um, I think it's out of uh, toilet paper and then it's covering it over. Yeah, I've seen that. And uh, I mean, the one thing is um, because of the taxes in Sweden, they importing stuff in I've heard is very very expensive so they end up things that we may go ahead and buy they don't they so they come up with these little methods to uh, to do it where um, to just use things that they have around the house as opposed to where we might, we might go out and buy something right right but he has a lot of very ingenious little things to uh, to you know to build different aspects of the railroad yeah, I, I might have mentioned this to you guys in the past, but there's a guy, Jerry Leone, uh, the Buena Vista Railroad, and he's big with uh, Model Railroader for years. And he does a, a, a piece called Off the Rails, or he used to. And uh, the last several um, installments, he was going back into the Model Railroaders from 30s and 40s and coming up with things that they created back then that are really still helpful little hints. And I was, I just, I have a list of ideas from all of those. So it's great because you don't have to like recreate the wheel. There's so many things that have already been established from prior Model Railroaders. And it's cool to uh, leverage those former ideas and how they're so relevant today. It's a lot of fun. Cool. Fred, thank you so much for your okay. time. Thank you. And I will tell you, Fred was, Fred's the guy that was going to do the uh, presentation on uh, the evolution of the steam locomotive for our era and maybe a little bit beyond or prior. Uh, and he had the unfortunate experience of having all of his research disappear in the ozone or in the internet zone so uh, he's rebuilding that presentation for us for some time in the future. Yes. Cool. I, I, my interest, I never would have believed this. You, know, you, you think of the big steam engines, but I got interest because I model 1900. I started to go backwards and I became quite fascinated with the locomotives from 1820. The first locomotives from you know, 1829 up through 1900. And I kept going back and going from 1829 to 19 to 1860. And uh, now, so what they, if they became big? I like the idea that they were little when they were 10 feet long, <laughs> but it's fascinating. And being an engineer, I wondered how did they, what did they know at that point? And Actually, this, this talk came, or, which was now on, uh, on hold, but I said to Tom, they didn't know how much steam they were generating. And he looked at me and he said, what? I said, yeah, that was my reaction when I started to realize that. And it turns out they really didn't. Well, why didn't they? And I've gone back and looked at a lot of this as to see what did they know and why didn't they know that or what happened? Why did they know things? And so the lo it affected the locomotives design. In fact, I can tell you one thing and it won't ruin the talk, I don't believe. Uh, they, what ended up developing the, uh, the two key parts of the uh, 440 was because they had bad track. Yeah, yes, That's, that prompted the two most important uh, inventions or uh, copy uh, patents in all of railroading. And that was the swivel truck and the equalization of wheels. It was because they had bad track that they couldn't uh, run it when they couldn't run the engines. That's great, that's fascinating. Yeah. fascinating. Hey, John White says that in his American- Does he say it? I've, I've read so much- Yes, sir. Okay, there's also, I've read all of this stuff, and it's at this point I'm not even sure where I saw something. <laughs> I don't know if there's 
there's a there's a fascinating book you can find on the internet by a fellow named D. Pambro, Francois D. Pambro, which was written in 1836. And it was he was looking at the English locomotives. And he gives you a very good description of how they worked and what they knew. And it was it's utterly fascinating that they knew what their, a lot of what their problems were, but they were not able to be solved until 19, the 1920s. Mm-hmm. They realized that there were problems, but they just didn't have the technology and the background and the research to be able to solve the problems. Right. But when you go through his and you read, have to read through this very slowly, because he sometimes uses different terms, but when you go through it, you realize they had they identified the problems. They just didn't know how to solve them. Mm. Can you imagine what one of the things they did is they machined out some of those uh, cylinders and stuff by hand. <laughs> yeah. By hand to get the uniform thickness by hand. I mean, that they were true craftsmen but, artisans. Yeah. They were just, that, that, that's, that's Matthias Baldwin in his first engine. Yeah. Check out the interior of the cylinder with a chisel. Unbelievable. Yeah, guys do. Wow. But then again, they prided themselves if they couldn't fit a coin in between the uh, edge of the uh, the uh, cylinder and the wall. So they, they, they weren't really doing this to standards we, we think of as standards these days. <laughs> I- it reminds me when I was first talking to Red Todd about this years ago, he, he put it in context of today for me. He says, imagine the, the guys of the, you know, the 1950s and 60s that were building rockets and, uh, or, or modifying automobiles for race cars. So in a sense, these engineers were, you know, the, the astronauts of the time, you know, the race car drivers, and they really took a lot of pride in those machines because they knew what it took to make them work and the risks involved had so many explosions of boilers and such so it was really cutting edge and uh it, it's fascinating to juxtapose what astronauts and such would have been going through and how they're they're riding this rocket with no idea whether or not they're going to be making it back or not and uh it took a lot of cojones to like do that Hence, it's not a surprise that so many of them were alcoholics. <laughs> right. They were all doing it. They were all doing it by the seat of their pants. Right. Uh, they were doing. They, they were making these things with blacksmith tools. You know. Wild, wild. Yeah. Good time. I wanted to ask Fred. Do you have a copy of this? Eighteen ninety-two. No. Modern locomotive construction. It would be right no, here. No, I don't have. Who who wrote that book? It's uh, J. G. A. Meyer. J. G. A. Meyer. No. You can, you, you can buy it off of Amazon, used book, uh, a modern reprint. It's, it's got about, what, 700 pages of everything you'd like to know about locomotives in the late 1800s. Uh, yeah, I did not see that one. I... It's M-E-Y-E-R. M E Y E R J G A Meyer. M E Y E R. I'll have to get a copy of that. Yes. Yeah. For, you know, yeah, for, rest you, for the rest of you guys who really are into locomotives, it's a lot of stuff in here is still, uh, you know, it, it was relevant for Civil War locomotives, and the technology didn't change quite that much. That's great. So you, you, can, you can pick up a lot of tips out of this book. Cool. Uh, especially if you had ever really wondered how the thing worked in the first place. Looks have, like it's available you ever for heard, download on uh, Google Books. So, yeah. Have you ever heard of, I think it's called the Advanced Steam Project in England? There is a group oh. over there that wants to bring back steam locomotives. I don't think they're going to be successful. <laughs> they have, they have, uh, they have done a tremendous amount of engineering which is available online on how to 
how you would build a steam locomotive now. And what's interesting about it is they still, there's still some theoretical problems in there they, they don't have an answer to. But you can look at the mathematics of it and you can see what they're doing now. And you can look back and you can also say, oh, in 1840 or in 1940, they didn't know that. I mean, actually, one of the key things I discovered was the reason they couldn't generate the steam was they didn't realize there was combustion taking place in any significant amount above the grate as opposed to on the grate. And once that was solved and they had proof of that, then you were able to build the superpower locomotives. But before that, you didn't, you couldn't put, you weren't putting enough air in to get a combustion, to get the evaporation, to generate the steam. Wow. And, and in, 19, in 1840, or any time like that, they had no concept. They knew they had to put air into it, but they had no idea that there was combustion occurring above the grate, six inches above the grate, as opposed to on the grate. And that was the key factor of developing the uh, superpower locomotives. When you say superpower, you're talking about the, the ones that came like in the 1890s? Nope, nope. The, in, eight, in 1913, the next my tremendous improvement in locomotive design occurred. And that was when they developed the coal ratios. But to do that, they had to have 20 years, <coughs> excuse me, they had to have 20 years of combustion research, of evaporation research. This was what the new, and uh, indicator re indicators, indicating, uh, I can't think of the term right now. But this oh, is where the, where the New York Central work, the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, Altoona shop, and there was a company, American, oh, I can't think of it. They did work on um, the fire, mm -hmm. on the, the um, oh, age is catching up to me. <laughs> In the firebox, the, um, oh, the fire, what blocks the fire in there? I can't think of it at the moment. The brick arch. The brick arch, thank you. You're not nearly as old as I am, so therefore you can come up with it. Uh, they, came, they were doing a great deal of combustion research. And you had 20 years worth of those three things, and then Cole sat down with all the public, published data and realized uh, how that the important thing was the, basically the rate of combustion. And he generated the coal ratios. And once they had those numbers, then they knew how much steam they were generating. And that's when you develop the 464, the 284. Mm. That's, that's really, really what gave you the four uh, trailing trucks, the trailing truck deal with four, because now you did that so you could build a large enough firebox back there. And there was no right. sense of building the firebox before then because you didn't know what you were going to get from it. Right. Changing the locomotive design without, for no good reason. But now you knew you needed a firebox of instead of, you know, eight by twelve or even ten by twelve. Now you needed fifteen by sixteen or something like that. Not not quite that big, but you know, you needed another step up in size. So you needed the four wheel truck at the back end to carry the weight. But until you had the combustion and evaporation knowledge, there was no reason to even think of building. Right. And that came about in 1913 when Francis Cole published his data. And that was probably the third great big, other than air brakes, that was probably the third big um, step up in locomotive design. So, cool. Yeah. So, well, thanks again, Fred. That was great. Well, Appreciate your you're time. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to present it. Yep. And um, I got to work on this talk now. Uh, if I'll tell everybody, if you have an iPad and you think you're saving it to uh, iCloud, make sure that Ver uh, Apple verifies it for you, because all the everything I had said yes, it's saved. And when Apple had to go in to get get it off of iCloud, they said, "Why didn't you save it?" was not a good night. <laughs> oh, man. I, oh. 
soon. Well, thanks a yeah. lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, so uh, I have I have one more polling question here for you guys. Um, here it is. Can you see that? A call boy was the term, and it referred to calls out uh, the train arrival and the track number. Uh, he's to find the engineer to prepare for his train, or it was the precursor to a call girl. He knew I what mean, bar the engineer was in. He knew the bar. <laughs> Or to find him, basically. Now, can you can you guys figure out? Okay, good. So you're responding. Good. Say a. <laughs> a. Okay, we got five out of fourteen. Who's not voted yet? Oh, we got six out of fourteen. There's seven, eight, nine. Good. I think I'm going to play with this next time. I'll come up see what else I can come up with. 11. God. All right. So who are the guys that said calls out the train arrival and track number? George, Charlie, Tom. Yeah, but Almost. I think it's I think it's B. It's actually yeah, C. Say. It was the precursor to the call girl. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It was B. It was B. <laughs> It was B. Yes, he knew exactly what Paul said. He knew where the bars were, and uh, and he knew where to go to get the engineers to get ready for their next run. Question. Yeah. Okay. He knew where the bars were. Well, yeah, because that's where the was engineers. Was he in any condition to go get the engineer? Oh yeah, these were younger fellas. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. These were guys that were like apprentices or you know runners, not runners, but uh, you know. They were the, the gophers at the time, but specifically devoted to knowing where the engineers were hanging out to get them on the track. So if, if you guys not, have any- it's not, It wasn't just uh, back then, it's today also. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they call the engineer to tell him what engine he's coming through. Oh, I used to receive it from my dad all the time. How about that? Okay. So cool. if yeah. you were visiting a town for the first time, you'd want to know, who the call boy was, so you know where all the bars were, where the red light district was, et cetera, et cetera, to have a good time. Is that what you're saying? That the call boy knew that? <laughs> I would think really he knew. What I'm, what I'm, well, all I'm saying is he knew where to find the engineers. Right. Yeah, Some might have been. Where there was a bar or a rooming house or what. Right. Right. DC. So like just 10 or 11 body. years old. 10 or 11 years old? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then into the 40s, they were still doing it. And they were they were usually teenagers, 14, 15, 16 high school kids. Right. And they would run around on their bike and knock on the engineer's door to make sure he got up in the morning too. So it wasn't wasn't just bars. They would go, they would actually go to the go to the engineer's house. Right. There's a they um there's a video on YouTube about Big Boy that was made by Union Pacific uh, in the 40s uh, or dramatizing it or something like that. And they they sh have a scene where the call boy shows up at the back door and knocks on the door as the missus is making breakfast in the morning. Neat. So I, I'm by sure. The way, oh, yeah. Paul? Uh, yeah, just, just for your information, I am now in a different state than when we started this meeting. I'm in Arizona now. That's great. Good. Fortunately, fortunately, there's three layers of technology. First, they built the railroad. Then they built the interstate. And then they built the cell towers along the interstate. So the cell towers followed the interstate. The interstate followed the railroad. And I can stay in contact. That's, that's, a, there you go. that's a good so thing. You're on the Amtrak? I'm on Amtrak. <laughs> So for uh, uh, I was started, I started in New Mexico when we started the meeting, and I'm now in in Eastern. Uh oh. Uh, well, we so peeled off from the interstate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a little gap with you there, Paul. I think you, there was a tower that might have been a little farther away. 
But yeah, um, it might have been. It's the first, that's the first cap there's been, though, believe it or not. Mm. It's been pretty smooth. That's good. I didn't know what to expect. So for, for any of you guys that have uh, knowledge of uh, slang or other terminology that I could throw into a poll next time, just send me an email. Because uh, I know there's a bunch out there, but I just don't know what they are. I, I do recall some. I'm not going to share them now, but uh, please let me know what you uh, would like to offer up. So, uh, so, Tom, at the Saturday, you guys were talking about hogsheads? Yes. So, originally, wine was stored in pig carcasses. They would use pig skin. So, so that's the or the origin of the word is is taken from uh, when they used uh, pig skin to form wine kegs, and that's how they transported wine. And so they not only were called hogsheads, but those barrel containers were also called pigs. Really? Okay. So that's where that came from. I I watched the recording of that and saw you guys debating that and went. Hmm, I know what the answer to that question is. <laughs> so the thing that I was looking at, too, is it mentioned that the capacity is supposed to be like 63 gallons or something like that. Yeah, they would they would they would skin the hog and then and then sew the, the joints where the, the legs would attach and they would yeah. they would stitch up the, the stomach from having peeled and, and used the skin and they'd fill right. it with wine. Right, right. So it dates back to like Roman. That makes sense. Yep. Yeah. So they'd also call, so that's where the term came from. They call them pigs, and then that must have just morphed into hogshead. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to do, and this might be getting really too into the into the weeds, but I was gonna list uh, <laughs> what kinds of products were shipped and what would be the relative containers from different kegs, barrels, what have you. Uh, just to have that prototypical detail available. Um, so I'm, I might reach out, or if any of you have any thoughts about wanting to uh, pursue that project with me, let me know. A lot of stuff you wouldn't, you might be surprised about was shipped in uh, kegs of one kind or another, or barrels. There's a uh, picture of the Cedar Level Station at uh, City Point on uh, in the uh, Library of Congress collection. And if you can zoom in close enough, and they, they, they scan those pictures to amazing uh, resolution, you can see on the top of the kegs or barrels, it says onions. Was like a was there a piece of paper or stamp? Do you think, Paul? It looked like it was burned in. Burned in. Ooh. Burned or painted on the top. Couldn't tell, but it said onions in there. Interesting. So, and that's a huge stack of barrels that held onions. So they have, apparently the Northern Army used a lot of onions. <laughs> oh, smelled good in camp, I'm sure. Anything to hide the smell. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Onions might be better than the camp. Right, right. So there's a photo of a Santa Fe stock car uh, with a big stack of uh, barrels of apples next to it. That's another one. That would that would kind of surprise me. I would think that uh, barrels would be pretty hard on apples, but yeah. Well, they still use the term apple barrel here and there. Yeah. I guess if you're making oh. apple sauce with them, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Put them in barrels so by the time they got wherever they're going, it was applesauce. Yeah. 